Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Center for Global Archaeological Research, University of Science Malaysia, I would like to thank the Ilham Gallery, especially to Ms. Rahel, for having me here in this academic discourse in regards to the topic of the Hindu Buddhist art in ancient Kedah. This is quite an inconclusive research because uh, the archaeological discoveries in regards to this Hindu Buddhist art is far from being uh, studied in terms of its uh, scientific analysis as well as its iconographic studies. So there are lots of debates in regards to this matter. Okay? But uh, the Center for Global Archaeological Research has been doing quite a number of archaeological surveys, excavations, as well as managing public archaeology and conservation projects on archaeological sites which can be dated from the Paleolithic period up to the colonial period. And archaeological sites which is being studied by us include the Paleolithic sites of Lengong Vedi, the prehistoric coastal site of Guadalupe, we also did some excavations on the Gandhara civilization sites in northwestern Pakistan, the Islamic sites of Aceh, northern Sumatra, and Barus, as well as the colonial sites in Fort Commodus. And one of our long term projects, which is still going on right now, is the research on Bujang Valley. When we talk about Bujang Valley, we must understand that it is a very large area. Okay? And the Bujang Valley is you know, it consisted of many archaeological complex. And the archaeological research done by my department revolves around the excavation, the survey, and the artifact analysis of a recently new and recently and newly discovered archaeological complex known as the Sungai Batu Archaeological Complex, where we uncovered and discovered, in fact, quite a number of iron smelting sites as well as the ruins of jetties which can be dated from the 6th century BC up to the 14th or to 15th century CE. Okay? Uh, the previous studies done by the other scholars uh, before the year 2008 has, has led to the discovery of a number of trade wares, you know, tens and thousands of them, most of them coming from China, India, and Arab, which can be dated somewhere between the 7th to the 14th century CE. This kind of discoveries has already given us lots of insight regarding the economic role of ancient Kedah, which is, it functioned as an entry port and at times as an emporium. However, our recent discovery in this Sungai Batu archaeological complex had shown that aside from functioning as an entry port, as the place where commodities from outside were taken together and being sold. But the uh, ancient Kedah also produced their own product. It became one of the main exporters for iron ingots in the region. You know, prior to 2008, there were, we discovered lots of Indian texts mentioning about this, mentioning that ancient Kedah produced iron, but nobody believed those texts because there was no archaeological discovery. And it was until 2008 when we did the excavation and we found the iron products and the dating happened to be the same with the dating of the Indian manuscript, then we started to believe that, yes, the Indian sources were accurate. Okay. So as far as the economic role of ancient Kedah, there is no debate about it. Everyone know that it functioned as a trading center and it functioned as an iron producing center. However, just to discuss about the economic role of ancient Kedah is not enough because we know that there were lots of people living there in those days. So we need to also discuss about the cultural and social aspect of the people in Jankada. And that is when the problem starts. As far as the economic role of ancient Kada is concerned, the archaeological data is very clear about it. Okay, we have direct evidence to show that it was an entry part and it was an iron producing center. Obviously, because we discovered uh, tens and thousands of ceramic pieces in various localities in Ancient Kedah. We discovered iron smelting sites by the hundreds. We found millions of tuya, you know, a blower for, for the furnace. We discovered uh, ruins of brick jetties, which were used to transport the iron product. So it is very clear that these remains uh, show that Ancient Kedah was an important trading center as, an, as well as an important iron producing center. But how about the people? 
what kind of political or internal political structure they had, what kind of socio-cultural and socio-religious makeup that they have, what kind of foreign relation they have with the Indians and the Sri Vijayans. So these are the matters which is still being intensely debated until today. It is due to the nature of discovery that we have. You know, we discovered quite a number of shrines, we discovered quite a number of sculptures, inscriptions, as well as various foreign texts, but these materials are open to interpretation. As a result, there is more than a single strand of narrative which can be able to explain this issue. Yeah? So there is no right and wrong in these different narratives. And what I am trying to do here is to present to all of you the kind of working hypothesis that we are using for our research. What kind, what is our opinion regarding this matter? Yeah, there, there will be other opinions, yeah, but I am going to present what do we think and what kind of approach that we are using in our research. Yeah? So, this is our center, eh? and uh, these are the various archaeological sites that we are, uh, that we are studying. Okay, in order for us to discuss about the cultural dynamic of the people of ancient Kedah, we need to first understand the cultural evolution of the people in the Malay Peninsula as a whole. First of all, we need to know that the Malay Peninsula had a very long history. And we had a very long cultural evolution. We began as hunter-gatherers and nomadic people living in the interior of the Malay Peninsula during the Paleolithic and Hobbinian period. And somewhere between 1500 to 1000 BC, these people started to have permanent settlements on the river, uh, on the riverine valleys as well on the coastal areas. And they started to practice some sort of agriculture. It is not a full-fledged agriculture, but some sort of agriculture. And then somewhere in 700 to 600 BC, for certain reason, we don't know how, but these people started to acquire the technology to smelt iron and other metals. Okay, So they entered into the Iron Age, somewhere in 600 BC. And during the same age, there started to be foreigners coming to the coast of the Malay Peninsula. These foreigners came from either India or China. It is due to the development of the sailing technology at that time. So there were contacts. Okay, trading context, cultural context between these coastal settlers, some of them practicing iron technology, with the foreigners, maybe traders, maybe pilgrims, from the year 600 BC to uh, from 700 to 600 BC. And how do we know this? We discovered quite a number of dongson drums. Okay, drums coming from southern Vietnam in various localities in the Malay Peninsula. So it showed that in 600 BC at least, they started to be trading contact between the locals and the people from the outside world. After a few hundred years, in somewhere in around 200 BC, we know that city-states, you know, political structures, kingdoms started to appear on the coastal areas of the Malay Peninsula. And how do we know this? We know from the Chinese texts during the Han Dynasty, where the Han court started to record that there were two kingdoms from the Malay Peninsula who sent tribute to the emperor, to the Han emperor, somewhere in 2nd century BC. So in the 2nd century BC, it marked the time when the proto-historic period started in the Malay Peninsula. Okay. In the 2nd century AD onwards, kingdoms started to sprang up along the shores of the Malay Peninsula. Kingdom started to sprang up around the shores of the Malay Peninsula, and the proto-historic period lasted from 2nd century AD up to the 14th century CE. It is during this period that archaeological remains, which can be related to the Hindu Buddhist art, started to appear. Huh? And these are among the archaeological discoveries which we found in the Malay Peninsula. I can say, according to our present discovery, Almost all, and I really mean it, all of the Hindu Buddhist uh, remains were found in Bujang Valley, except for these uh, six artifacts. 
Almost all of them were discovered only in Bujang Valley. And these are isolated findings. Okay, the first three on the top. The first one is Avalokiteshvara, the second one is a Standing Buddha, and the third one is Avalokiteshvara. They were found in Perak, in Bido, in Sungai Siput, but we were not sure regarding the archaeological context of these findings. Although they can be dated somewhere between the 8th to 9th century CE, we were not sure whether they were being brought in the, in the later period. We were not sure. Okay, so, and the, uh, in the second row, those are the votive tablets. The first two were from Kelantan, and the third one is from Perlis. They were discovered in a, in a cave, yeah? and they took somewhere between the 13th to 14th century CE. So these are the only Hindu Buddhist remains that we found outside Bujang Valley. Nothing else. Okay? So uh, as I've mentioned earlier, ancient Kedah is the only location in the Malaysian Peninsula where we could find archaeological or cultural remains related to the Hindu Buddhist art. And in order for us to discuss about the nature of Hindu Buddhist art in Malaysia, we should just focus on ancient Kedah and the Pujang Valley. Okay? So, let us go a little bit into the concept of Indianization. Okay? Maybe some of you were aware of this concept. We know that during the same period, the proto-historic period in the Malay Peninsula, somewhere between the 2nd to the 14th century CE, somewhere between the 2nd to the 14th century CE, we could observe the rise of many kingdoms or city-states or chieftaincies in Southeast Asia. For example, in the mainland Indochina, we had the Angkorian Kingdom. We had the city-states of Dvaravati. We had the Hamsavati Kingdom. In Sumatra, we had the Malay Empire of Sri Vijaya. And in Java, we had the Kingdom of Madang, the Kingdom of Kediri, the Kingdom of Majapahit, and we have the principalities of Bali. And we also have the Kingdom of Kutai in Sumatra. Yep. And all these kingdoms were said to have been Indianized. Okay? And they express their culture in the form of their art, writings, architecture, language, and religion. So based in all these aspects, we know that they have adapted some aspects of the Indian culture, they absorbed into their own, and they manifested the culture into their material, uh, in the, into a material form of which the architecture and sculpture, etc. And how do we define Indianization? According to George Sides, we can consider Indianization as the expansion of organized culture based on Indian conception of royalty, characterized by Hindu Buddhist cults, the mythology of the Puranas, and the observance of the Dharma Shastras. That is the definition of Indianization as being put by George Sidas. And it seems, it seems to apply to all the kingdoms that I have already mentioned earlier. Okay? However, we have to bear in mind that Southeast Asia is far from being homo a homogeneous society. People in Southeast Asia come, came from different language groups, different ethnicity, and their culture evolved under different environments, different geography, different ecozone, and different locations also. So naturally, their social conditions which led to their evolution is also different and how they reacted to external cultural stimulus for this case the Indian culture is also different so we cannot expect the people from say from Indochina to have the same level of Indianization as the people who live in East Timor okay so the level of Indianization is different from one area to the other and we should not paint the whole region with the same color and this is the case for ancient Kedah. We know that we have uncovered lots of artifacts related to the Hindu Buddhist art in ancient Kedah. But there is a question regarding whether these discoveries really represented the culture of the local people. This is the question which has been debated for years. And since the year 1850, it was more than 167 years this issue has been debated by scholars and not yet resolved. Why? Because, number one, ancient Kedah is a city-state or a collection of city-states located on a coastal area and easily reached by the outsiders. 
So the artifact may as well be left by the traders. Secondly, the artifacts which were found were so austere in terms of their art and aesthetic value that they are open to interpretations. We cannot simply give a single narrative to explain the origin of the artifacts. And in order for us to settle this matter, we cannot simply use archaeology to explain everything. We need to use other different approach in order to be able to discuss regarding the dynamics of the Hindu Buddhist art in ancient Kedah. And what is being done by my department is that aside from studying the history, the historical record as well as the archaeological data, we also use the approach of ethnography as well as the study of geomorphology in order for us to give, get a clearer insight regarding the cultural dynamics of the people in ancient Kedah. Now, regarding the nature of the Hindu Buddhist arts in ancient Kedah, there are three main mainstream theories who give their own opinions about it. Okay? So, the theories were first by H.G. Quaritch Wills, suggested in the year 1940 in his uh, archaeological report. He mentioned that the people of ancient Kedah were colonized by the Indians due to the continuous arrival of the Indian traders. As a result, the Indians established the colony in ancient Kedah and the local people were fully Indianized, they totally forsake their um, local identity and they practice Indian culture in its purest form. That is the theory of H.G. Quaritch Wills in 1940. And his theory were being backed by the Greater Indian Society, especially by Dilakanta Sastri and R.C. Majumdar. And he based his argument on a few artifacts, you know, some small sculptures which he said to have resembled the art of Venji, Amaravati, Gupta, and Post Gupta. I'm going to show you the artifacts later. Okay? The second theory is suggested by Alastair Lamb and Nick Hassan Shuhaimi. Alastair Lamb, uh, he's a British researcher, and Nick Hassan Shuhaimi is from UKM. Yeah? So he, on the other hand, rejected Quaritch Wales' opinion and suggested the Indianization theory instead. He said that the locals were not colonized, but they simply, due to the trade context, the local started to pick and choose various aspects of the Indian culture and assimilate it with their own culture. So they were not colonized, but they were Indianized. Okay? And uh, he kind of justified his theory based on the usage of timber as the superstructure of a temple in Bujang Valley. Okay? Whether or not the uh, the, this uh, justification is valid or not, we are going to discuss later. Okay? And Nick Hassan Swami supported the theory of Alastair Lamb according to his excavation in Kampung Sungai Mas, where he discovered quite a number of monuments which resemble the Balinese and the Indo-Javanese architecture. Okay? Now, this is the second theory. The first is colonization and the second is Indianization. <coughs> and the third one is the most interesting theory. It is by Jane S. Allen and Michelle Jacques Hegwatch. Jane S. Allen is an American scholar who did a geoarchaeological survey in the year 1988, and Michelle Jacques did the survey during, pretty much during the same time. And they said that the local were never influenced by Indian culture, but the, all the artifacts were simply being left by the traders. So there are three mainstream theories. As I mentioned, the colonization, the Indianization, and the third one, the Indian culture never touched the people of ancient Kedah. Okay? So, before we go further to discuss about all these different theories regarding the dynamics of Hindu Buddhist art in ancient Kedah, we need to understand the profile of ancient Kedah. Okay? So, we need to know the question of what when, where, why, and how of ancient Kedah. If we don't define this matter, then we are not able to, be, uh, to discuss properly. Yeah? First, this is the map of uh, Bujang Valley, where most of the archaeological sites were situated. Okay? And this is the topographical map and uh, the locations of various archaeological sites. the locations of various archaeological sites. So we can see that most of the sites were concentrated to the south of the Gunung Jerai. And we have one isolated site over there. 
It is a Buddhist site and currently being studied by me. Okay? So most of the Hindu Buddhist sites are located over here. Okay, they are concentrated in various locations. Yeah? So let us start with the first question. What is ancient Kedah? The definition is very simple. It is simply a collection of ancient riverine and coastal settlements located in the northwestern coast of the Malay Peninsula. That's it. Most people did the mistake of looking at ancient Kedah as a single political, cultural and settlement entity. But that is not the case. Ancient Kedah is a collection. It is a confederation of many, many settlements which are aligned to each other. And these settlements are located in an area somewhere from Phuket down to Kuala Selinsing. Okay? And it happened that most of the settlements with lots of archaeological discoveries were found in the Bujang Valley area. However, the settlements could have spread along the shores of the northwestern coast of the Malay Peninsula. So ancient Kedah is far bigger than what we initially thought. So it is not a single entity, but it is a collection a loose confederation of many, many, many settlements of which some of the settlements had continuous trade contacts with the Indian traders and Arab traders. We need to be clear about that. Okay? And most of the settlements are located in the Bujang Valley. Okay? And we say that most of the settlements based on the number of archaeological discoveries found. Okay? And what is Bujang Valley? Bear in mind that Bujang Valley is a modern term. It is a modern term only created in the 1970s by the Department of Museums and Antiquity to refer to the area where archaeological remains believed to have been related to ancient Kedah. Okay? So, Bujang Valley currently, based on the present discovery, it expands from Bukit Choras in the north down to Sungai Muda in the south and we discovered some sites in the upper reaches of the Muda River. So this is the area of Bujang Valley according to the location of archaeological discoveries. However, based on the historical text by the Arabs and the Indians, they say that uh, ancient Kedah could have uh, referred to the whole western coast of the Malay Peninsula. However, the archaeological discovery has not yet been found because in other settlements, their houses or their palaces could have been made of perishable materials. So it couldn't last for more than 100 years. So, but for Bujang Valley, it is different because they were being built. You know, uh, it is due to the settlements of the Indians, I'm going to explain that later, were made of uh, imperishable materials, of stones, etc. So we could find the archaeological sites. Okay? Okay, the third question. When did ancient Kedah existed? Okay, it started, ancient Kedah started to be recognized as an international part from the period of 2nd century CE based on two poems, Patinapalai and Silapadikaram. It mentioned about the port of ancient Kedah. So it means that 2nd century onwards, ancient Kedah started to be recognized as a port and as a political entity. But however, according to our recent archaeological discovery, it shows that the settlement, the Iron Age settlement in ancient Kedah started to exist from 500 BC, but they were not yet recognized. Okay? It, only, it was only recognized after the 2nd century CE. And then it existed up to 14th century. How do we know? We knew based on two records. Number one is based on the discovery of ceramics. We found very small number of Ming Dynasty ceramic in ancient Kedah, which shows that in the 14th to 15th century CE, the trading has already dwindled because there were not much Ming, uh, Ming dated ceramic. And the last time ancient Kedah were ever mentioned inside foreign record was in Nagara Kritagama, a Javanese text dated in the 14th century CE. So this is how we derive the date for the development of ancient Kedah. What characterizes ancient Kedah? So, due to a large number of cultural remains, we have to remember one thing. Yeah? Ancient Kedah is not the only kingdom or city-state in the Malay Peninsula. 
We have dozens of other kingdoms. But the difference between the other kingdoms and ancient Kedah is ancient Kedah contains lots of cultural remains. While other city-states, we only know them based on historical records. When we go to the site, we can't find any archaeological findings. Huh? Why? It is due to four reasons. First, because of its strategic location. We know that ancient Kedah is located at the entrance of the Strait of Malacca. Yeah? And it is where ships coming from southeastern India had to stop on their way towards the south through the Strait of Malacca. And those who wanted to go into the Bay of Bengal must stop in ancient Kedah. So it is firstly because of its strategic location. Number two, because of the geological setup. In those days, ancient Kedah was a big protected bay. So lots of ships can be able to harbor safely inside the bay. Thirdly, geomorphological setup, the presence of lots of fresh water, because there were three main rivers in ancient Gada in those days. We have the Muda River, the Bujang River, and the Batu Pahat River, which, product, which, uh, which produces lots of abundance of uh, fresh water and its biodiversity. We know that ancient Kada also were connected to the interior of the Malay Peninsula through the Muda River. The interior of the Malay Peninsula is very rich in forest products, were in high demand in those days. So because of these three factors, Traders kept on coming to ancient Kedah. And there were two additional factors also. Number one is because of Gunung Jerai. Because in those days, Gunung Jerai was in fact uh, a small peninsula extending towards the sea. So it became a natural beacon for ships. And number two, because of its abundance in iron ore. So it also produced lots of iron. So these are all the attraction factors which make it a very important part as compared to other city-states in the Malay Peninsula. Most city-states in the Malay Peninsula could not last for more than 100 years, while ancient Kedah lasted for 2,500 years. Okay? So this is why ancient Kedah was so prominent. How did ancient Kedah develop? So as usual, as I mentioned earlier, most of the city-states in the Malay Peninsula developed due to trade, due to contact and cultural exchange, and due to urbanization, due to the uh, flowing in of the commodities. So due to all these factors, ancient Kedah developed and with a, an extra sim stimulus because of the iron ore, because of the iron production center, then people kept on coming and it make, made ancient Kedah economically important. And who live in ancient Kedah? This is a very uh, interesting question. Huh? So we know, based on our ethnographical research, based on archaeological discoveries, and based on historical texts, we know that there are three elements of population in ancient Kedah. Number one is the native populations. Who are the native population that I'm going to discuss later? Second, there were communities of foreign traders and pilgrims. And number third, we have people from the dominating empire. We know that ancient Kedah, from time to time, was conquered or were controlled by the bigger empire such as Funan, Srivijaya, Suvarnamubi, and Majapahit. So these people, when they conquered ancient Kedah, they sent their representative to ancient Kedah to control the trade over there, to take care of the interests of the empires. So these are possibly the people who were living in ancient Kedah in those days. And what are the main aspects of research in ancient Kedah? So we have four main aspects of research. Number one is the study of the economy. The economy of ancient Kedah can be interpreted based on the discovery of trade west, like I mentioned earlier, and the discovery of the iron smelting sites. Number two, uh, we, we are trying to study the demography, which means the distribution of settlement. Okay, this can be studied based on the study of geomorphology. And uh, we, it is difficult for us to really pinpoint how the population was distributed because in those days, their dwellings could have been made of something perishable, perishable materials which couldn't last long. So this aspect of research is pretty much speculative. Yeah? Maybe based on the distribution of potteries and earthenwares, we can be able to speculate, but uh, at best, it is a learned guess only. Politics. This is also very, uh, very interesting. We can be able to discuss about the political nature of ancient Kedah based on the discovery of few inscriptions found in India as well as from the ethnographic aspect. When I say ethnography, based on the Malay text. Okay? We have Hikayat Murung Mahawangsa, 
We have Altari Salah Sidah Nikedah and other Malay annals, but I do not consider them as historical sources. I call it a literature historical sources. We can be able to get some idea regarding the conception of Malay politics, but we cannot use that as a direct source to interpret the political structure. And finally, the culture. When it comes to culture, there are three main aspects that we need to study. The religion, art and architecture, as well as the material culture. So uh, we are going to focus today on this aspect. Okay. And what are the approach adopted in the research of ancient Gada, at least by uh, Center for Global Archaeological Research? We use four main approach. Number one is archaeology, naturally based on artifacts and also based on scientific analysis. When I say scientific analysis, I refer to elemental analysis where we study the trace elements inside the artifact and we try to pinpoint where the artifacts came from. Secondly, is on the chronometric dating. We use OSL and carbon dating to determine the date of the artifacts. Secondly, history. You know, most of the historical records on ancient Kedah were based on foreign records. So we need to analyze the foreign records and deal them with caution, of course. Thirdly, ethnography. Of course, regarding the material culture of the locals of ancient Kedah, uh, regarding their form of settlements, we couldn't find any archaeological evidence. So we tried to compare their settlement with the settlement of the Orang Laut, which exists today. You know, uh, the sea nomads. Because Kedah was a coastal settlement, so we think that the local Kedahans possibly live like the sea nomads. So we tried to compare the present society of sea nomads and try to compare them with the people of ancient Kedah. And finally, geomorphological study. The purpose of studying geomorphological study is to put the artifacts into its proper context because the form of the Kedaf configuration today, you know, is different from those 500 years ago. The, in terms of the geography, in terms of the coastline, is totally different. So we need to study the ancient environment of ancient Kedah. So there are four main approaches that we use in order to answer the question regarding the Hindu Buddhist art of ancient Kedah. Okay? So before we dwell further into the debate regarding the dynamics of Hindu Buddhist art of Asia Gada, we need to have a look at the archaeological data. Because the point of departure for all arguments of ancient Gada comes from the archaeological data. How we interpret the archaeological data is a different story, but it must be based on archaeological data. And uh, however, the archaeological artifacts, you know, the artifacts that we have here were mostly excavated before the 70s. Okay? And uh, most of the excavations, especially 30 sites of Hindu Buddhist shrines, were excavated in the year 1937 by H.G. Quaritch Wales. And in those days, we don't have the Heritage Act yet. After they excavated the monuments, we, they didn't record properly what kind of artifacts they found, and most of them ended up in foreign museums. Yeah? And most of them were lost also. So we simply have the photographs of those materials, but we don't have the actual artifacts anymore. And the little that we have, it is being preserved in the Bujang Valley Archaeological Museum. The little that we have, and of course we are taking them, taking care of them nicely. Yeah? So in this part, I am going to show to you almost all of the archaeological data that we have. Almost all. So the artifacts are being preserved in the Bujang Valley Archaeological Museum. Some are not for display, but I'm going to display it here. Uh, it is in reserve collection. Some are being preserved in some foreign museums, such as uh, the British Museum and the Raffles Museum. And some are simply missing. Since the 1937, we simply have the photograph only. But it is enough for us to study them. Okay? So we will begin with the historical text. As far as the historical text regarding ancient Kedah is concerned, only Two group of archaeological uh, historical records which mention Kedah quite a lot. Eh? Firstly, is the Indian, and secondly, the Arab text. So they have the tendency of describing Kedah in detail, and this is not surprising because we know the position of ancient Kedah at the entrance of Strait of Malacca. So it gives Kedah an advantage, especially to traders coming from the west. Okay, so we can expect lots of 
traders from Arab, from India, from Persia to visit ancient Kedah. And consequently, most of the record also come from these people. Okay? So, firstly is the Indian records. The earliest, earliest Indian record can be dated somewhere between the 2nd century BC to 2nd century CE. And uh, the name of the record is the poems of Patinapalai. Okay, uh, this poem, it mentioned about items from Karshagam. Karshagam is a name for ancient Gada, and the items could have referred to iron. And secondly, in Silapadikaram, it mentioned about alus wood coming from Kidara. Alus wood, it is a kind of wood, you know, I'm not sure what they are used for, but it is a kind of wood which is being traded in ancient Gada. So in 2nd century BC, these two records mentioned that these two items were traded in the port of Kaverupum Patinam in southern India, which is not surprising. Okay? That is 2nd century BC. It means that during this time, the Indian traders, especially from the south, started to recognize ancient Kedah as an entry port. Okay? And then in the 4th century CE, in the Jataka stories, as, uh, known as uh, the Supraga Jataka by Arya Shura, it mentioned that the kingdom of Suvana Mubi has two uh, I mean, the, the, the area of Subana Bumi have two kingdoms, one located in the east coast and one located in the west coast. The east coast is the kingdom of Lankashoba, and the west coast is kingdom of Kadara. Kadara is ancient Kedah, and Lankashoba refers to Lankasuka of Patani, which is in the east coast, in the 4th century CE. And then, in the 8th century CE, we have the Katasarit Sagara and Kaumudi Mahot Sava. In this uh, Sanskrit epics, uh, they use Kataha or Kedah as the background for their plot of narrative. So in many cases, they refer ancient Kedah as a very lively part, a very important and busy part. And that is dated somewhere between the 8th to 9th century CE. And then, in the 10th century CE, we have the Tamil poem of Parung Katai. And it mentioned clearly that the iron from Kedah, it mentioned as Katatu Yirumbu, means iron from Kedah, was being used to make good quality chariots in southern India. And then, finally, in the 11th century CE, we have a number of inscriptions found in the Chola Kingdom, where they recorded lots of diplomacy and conflict between Kedah and the Chola Kingdom. It's not just conflict, but also diplomacy. Okay? For instance, we have the larger Leiden plate, dated somewhere in the year 1014. Okay, 1014, it is by Raja Raja the first. It mentioned about the construction of a temple in the Chola Kingdom by the king of Srivijaya in Kedah. In the year uh, 1025, the king Rajendra Chola mentioned Kedah as one of the kingdom which was being attacked or raided by him. And then in the year 1068, we have the Vira Rajendra inscription which appears that the relation between Chola and Kedah has already been restored. It mentioned that the king Virarajendra helped the king of Srivijaya to restore order in ancient Kedah. And finally, we have the smaller laden plate in the year uh, eight, uh, 1090. It shows some description regarding the renewal of land grant to maintain a temple in uh, the Chola Kingdom by the king of ancient Kedah also. So in the 11th century CE, we have lots of records regarding the conflict in diplomacy between Kedah and the Chola Kingdom. Okay? So, these are the records on, of the Indians in ancient Kedah, dated from the 2nd century BC up to 11th century CE. Now, we can go to the Arab records. The Arab records on the ancient Kedah is extremely, extremely abundant, and I can just show a few of them, because I'm just given one hour, so usually it takes three hours for this lecture, so I... <laughs> just show a few important ones only. So most of the records can be dated from the 9th century CE up to 14th century CE. The first record, uh, it is by Akbar Ashin Walhin. It mentioned that Kedah consisted of many islands and it was ruled by the king of Sriwijaya. Okay, I'm going to show you later. Okay, Second record, by Abu Zaid, it mentioned that Kedah was ruled by Sriwijaya and it is the center of entry port for rainforest products, you know, uh, such as uh, rhinoceros horn, elephant tusk, uh, uh, you know, uh, honey. All those rainforest products were, were found in ancient Kedah 
of course, we don't find any discovery because those are perishable materials. Number three, we have uh, the source of Muqtasar al-Ajaib. It mentioned, very importantly, that ancient Kedah was inhabited by communities of Indian traders. Clearly, it was mentioned there. Number four, the 12th century uh, El Idrisi, it mentioned ancient Kedah as a very big pot. It is the center of collection for rainforest products and they have high quality tin and iron and the people there wear sarung. They call it futa. Yeah? So they wear sarung. Eh? Number five, we have the Muj'am al-Buldan. It mentioned that the Kedah is the last spot to be visited before you move on to the Bay of Bengal. And it is the first spot for you to visit before you enter Strait of Malacca. Okay? And uh, number six, by Abu Abul Fida, it mentioned that in ancient Kedah, we have the Persian community, Arab community, and the Indian community living together. Okay? So these are the Arab records. So it clearly shows the position of ancient Kedah as a center of entry port, a metropolitan, where people from various areas live together to trade. Okay? And coincidentally, these records can have the same dating with the artifacts that we found. We have the Indian artifacts, for instance, from 2nd century CE up to 11th century CE. So those artifacts were abundant. As well as the Arab artifacts, we have the ceramics dated from 9th century CE to 14th century CE also. So it goes hand in hand with the archaeological discovery. Okay? Now, enough about historical record. Those are something very intangible. People can make up stories. You know, if we choose to be uh, skeptical about the records, then let us look at the tangible records, which are the archaeological records. Now, the archaeological discoveries in the Buja Valley is extremely extensive. Okay? Uh, for instance, in the Sungai Batu archaeological complex, we discovered 100 cultural mounds, 100 of them, and we just excavated 54 of them. And when we did survey on further area, and we found more mounds, so we speculated that there could be at least 200 sites in the Sungai Batu archaeological complex alone. And bear in mind, in Bujang Valley, we have five complexes. We have the Sungai Batu archaeological complex, Pengkalan Bujang complex, Sungai, uh, Sungai Mas, Simpo Tambang, and Kampung Sireh. There are five complexes, and in Sungai Batu, we have 200 sites already. Only a fraction of them were being excavated. And uh, these findings were found through excavations, survey, and some random discoveries by the local villagers. You know, and they have been kind enough to hand over to us the artifacts. Okay, they, they have this awareness you know, regarding the importance of heritage. And uh, these discoveries, uh, except for Sungai Batu, they can be dated from the 4th century CE to the 14th century CE. In Sungai Batu, it can be dated far earlier. Uh, 6th century BC. So the recent Sungai Batu discovery has pushed the date quite early and you know most of the discoveries except Sungai Batu consisted of trade wares, beads, iron smelting sites, shrines, sculptures and inscriptions. So we are going to have a look at those findings. Okay? We start with the iron smelting sites. So regarding the iron smelting site, yeah, we have normal discoveries. Firstly, these are the iron furnaces, broken ones, and these are the intact furnaces. Okay? And these are the tuya or a blower. So it is usually connected to the furnace to uh, channel in the gases yeah, in order to uh, increase temperature. And this is the discovery of jetty. Jetty sites made of bricks. And there were at least 20 of them being excavated so far. So far, yeah? And most of them are located on the ancient coastline, directly into the coastline. Yeah? So uh, usually the jetty sites are connected to the furnace site so that they can be able to transport the iron ingot directly onto the jetty and ship it off to be sold. Yeah? So this is the study area of the Sungai Batu complex. So you can see there are lots of unexplored area. So over here, so we are still surveying this area. Okay, it is a very big project. We have been doing it for 10 years already. Huh? And uh, near to the complex, we found lots of iron ores which are still being mined until today. Okay? And those are high quality irons. Huh? It is coming from the magnetite 
uh, all. So uh, it is around this area, just one or two kilometers away, we have uh, iron mines, huh? which is still functioning. Huh? So this is why Kedah was so important. They produce iron. And then the most important discovery are trade west and beads. Okay. So these are among the ceramics which were found in ancient Kedah. And let me tell you, in Pengkalan Bujang itself, we have discovered at least 50,000 pieces of ceramics dated from the Sung to the Yuan period. Only from the Sung and Yuan period, around 50,000 pieces of ceramic has been excavated since the year 1937. And most of them are still being preserved in the museum collection. Okay? And then, as, um, aside from the Chinese ceramics, we, can, we did also find some earthenware coming from India. We found a glazed earthenware coming from Arabia and also Persian glasses and Arab glasses. And these ceramics are very important indicator to show the trade volume of ancient Gada. In order for us to pinpoint where the trading took place, it is based on the discovery of hordes of these ceramics. And most of them were discovered near to the uh, estuary of a river. Okay, at the mouth of the river, so there were lots of uh, such ceramics were found. Okay. Okay, those are beads. So those are Indo-Pacific beads. Uh, those who, which are dated before the 6th century CE were probably brought in by traders, but those dated after the 6th century CE were produced locally. And the complex which were believed to be the center for production of beads were Sungai Mas, dated, uh, located somewhere in the Sungai Muda River. Okay? So these are all in the museums. Huh? Okay, this is in the reserve collection. So these are the beads. And in Kampung Sungai Mas itself, we've, according to the recent calculation, they discovered around 5 million pieces of beads in Kampung Sungai Mas. We, they discovered just by, uh, by the kilos, you know? So, and they are still being uh, studied by us, of course, by one of our PhD students. Okay, so uh, we can conclude that uh, the ceramics and the beads were found in hordes in big numbers, mostly dated from the 7th to 14th century CE, and mostly came from China. And glasses and the glazed pottery are from Arabia, Persia, and India. So we also had some earthenware and it presents the location for settlement and serve as an indicator to determine the extent of international trade. So if there were lots of ceramics during that time, so it means that that area had a very intense trade. If they have less ceramic, it means that they don't have much trade. So it is used as an indicator. And the location for the discovery is somewhere over here, near to the ancient coastline. Okay? You see? Those are the discoveries. Okay? Now, these are the percentage of the ceramics. So the, those in red in color can be dated from the 10th to 14th century CE. Blue in color, 7 to 10, and green in color uh, uh, after the 14th century CE. So it shows that Kedah started to, de to decline after the 14th century CE, and based on the number of ceramic, then it means that during the 10th to the 14th, it is the peak period for the development of ancient Kedah. Okay? Uh, this is taken from my master's thesis. Huh? It was written in Malay. Okay, the second form of discovery, which is very interesting, is the inscriptions. Okay, over here, I am going to show to you all inscriptions, and I literally mean all inscriptions which were found in ancient Gada. Okay, this is the Chirot Tokun inscription being written on a boulder, carved on a boulder. Okay, it has been, it was said to be translated by Letley somewhere, in, maybe in the late 19th century, but when I revisited the translation, he was obviously lying about the translation, so I reinterpreted the inscription. Okay? So it is still being studied today. But we, we can read here, it is Pratame, yeah? it is Vayasi, it means that uh, I, I was here first, something like that. Yeah, it's something. yeah, yeah. Pratame Vayasi, I was here first. So he's, uh, in the translation of lately, he mentioned, that, oh, this is the king, this king, that king, you know, those are all not so accurate. <laughs> okay. okay, the second inscription, uh, it is found on top of a Bukit Meriam. This inscription was found somewhere in the late 19th century. They only managed to make a hand copy of the inscription, and that inscription mi mysteriously went missing after that. You know, I don't know who took it, but it was uh, before 19th century. So maybe it went to the antiquity market or something. Okay? Yeah. And then there is two tablets. This is the 
we call it the Buddha Maha Mahanavika inscription, and this is the Kampung Sungai Mas inscription. This inscription was found uh, alongside with lots of trade ceramics, and it is currently in the Calcutta Museum. Okay, and this inscription was also discovered in Kampung Sungai Mas. It is with us right now. Okay, in the Bujang Valley Archaeological Museum, uh, it represented a stupa. Okay, this is a Buddhist stupa and with a Buddhist mantra, a very short mantra. And it is made of a slate stone and most possibly were brought in from outside. And uh, as far as the paleography is concerned, it shows Central India or South Indian uh, influence. Okay, Sanskrit language. Huh? Okay, these are the inscriptions from Bukit Choras. You know, the site which I was studying, I'm studying right now. So this inscription is in the British Museum. Okay, it contains a Buddhist mantra. This one, one inscription also, contains a Buddhist mantra. It is in the Raffles Museum. And this one, the, it is a very small right, letter here. It can be read as Masala. <laughs> yeah, seriously. It is Masala. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we don't know where the inscription is right now. And this inscription, I uh, was discovered in Kampung Sungai Mas, containing Buddhist mantra also, uh, has already been translated and published by me, and uh, it is uh, in the reserve collection of the museum department right now. Okay? This is another inscription discovered by USM, okay? uh, in the Sungai Batu Archaeological Complex, containing mantra and using uh, Southern Indian script, dated from the 7th to 8th century CE. Okay? And this is six pieces of silver disc. Okay? Okay, uh, it is quite unique as most of the inscriptions were written in Indian scripts, but for this one, it is written in old Javanese script. And the kind of script which, which we saw at the foot of the Borobudur, same polygraphy, clear Javanese influence, and it mentioned the name of Bodhisattvas, the same kind of cult which were being worshipped in Java at that time. Okay? We have we discuss, discuss further on this. And we have short inscriptions. This is Tra, Tra and Om. Yeah, and this is all Javanese script. And this is also Om, Javanese script dated from the 14th century CE of the Majapahit period. And uh, the only uh, Arabic script and I say Ibn Sirdan was here or something like that. Okay. So that's all. Those are the description that we found. Most, uh, most of them are associated with the shrine sites or trading sites. They are very small in size. They are dated from the 6th to the 14th century CE. And they contain Buddhist mantras, short incantations, name of bodhisattvas, or simple utterance of Om. It is very, very short. They are either being carved on the site or simply portable inscription can be brought by anyone on the ship easily. Okay? And they are written in Pallava script and old Javanese, foreign script, and they are either small in size or calf in situ. Okay? So let us move on to the next archaeological data. So we have discussed about trade wares and beads. We have seen the inscriptions. Okay? Now we can have a look at the shrines, the temples. Yeah? So as far as the temples are concerned, HG Kwarishwen has excavated 30 temples in the year 1937. But because we don't have Heritage Act during that time yet, after he excavated, the temple was simply destroyed after that, you know, by looters, or they simply left the site without doing any conservation. Okay? So these are the shrines which is still exist today and under our care. So these are the shrines from the uh, Pengkalang Bujang Archaeological Complex. So uh, this one is a Hindu temple. Possibly for Ganesha, we found a Ganesha sculpture inside there. This too is a Buddhist temple, we found Buddhist sculpture of this. And this one, it is quite special, we don't know what it is. Yeah, uh, we, are, we, are, we, can, we can't be sure, because we, do, we didn't find any sculpture inside there. We couldn't find any inscription, we just find lots of ceramics. Yeah? So we were not sure. Okay? So we archaeologists need to be honest, if we don't know, we say we don't know. Huh? And then these are the temples which are still around. Okay, this is site number 16, this is site number 8, uh, somewhere in Bukit Batu Pahat. These are all the inscriptions, uh, and this is still around. And uh, this is just a replica, but the site is still there, but I was not able to enter the site. The bushes are too tall. Huh? I'm not going to risk my life going there. Okay, so, and then this is another site. 
uh, which has been recently destroyed. You know, at this site number 11, 11 3. It was a big hoo ha about it. It was destroyed like a few years ago. And, uh, but, I, but we managed to do some documentation. It was me like 10 years ago. So I managed to do the measurements of the temple before it was destroyed. Okay? And these are the site which were excavated in the year 1937 before they were destroyed. So we have lots of documentation on this site. So although they were destroyed, so we managed to study them and reconstruct them by using some software. I'm going to show you uh, the reconstruction later. And one thing about the, te the temples that we found in Bujang Valley is that they are very simple in terms of the architecture. They are very small and there is very minimum elaborations on the temple. However, on very few exceptions, we could find some elaboration being carved from a sandstone and granite stone. So these are the elaborations used to decorate the temple. So the first row is from a Sungai Mas temple. So we can see some sandstone or granite being carved and then used to decorate the temple. So these are some elaborations also. Some are used as you know, uh, pillar bases. You know, some are used as a rooftop of the temple over here. And these are further elaborations. Okay. And these are the example of the pillar bases. You see, uh, most of the uh, temples that we found in Bujang Valley, they only consisted of the substructure, the basement of the temple. But the superstructure could have been made by perishable materials, which were wood. And we knew this based on the discovery of these pillar bases. And based on the arrangement of the pillar bases, we can be able to do some conjectural reconstruction of the temple. Okay? So for instance, this is the temple. We look at the arrangement of the uh, pillar bases, and my student reconstructed the temple. Like this. Okay, so it was uh, being reconstructed by my master student. Huh? So I think I think we could have done a better job, you know. But okay, this is the best that he could do. Okay. <laughs> anyway. Most of the temple uh, can be dated from the 7 to the 5. Oh, okay, he did a very good job. It's recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this thing has already been published, and we are going to publish the next one. So we are going to publish uh, this site. Wait, hold on. Huh? This temple. So it is already like almost destroyed. So we are going to reconstruct this temple, but by using a more sophisticated method, and we can expect a good result after this. Okay, better than this one. <laughs> okay, uh, so most of the temples are dated from the 7th to 14th century. Okay, most of them, and we determine the date based on the discovery of the ceramics associated with the temple. So if it is Tang ceramic, then it is 7th century. Sung, maybe 10 to 13, and then Ming, 14th century. Okay, so they are located, their locations are all co uh, overlap with the trading area. All nearby, uh, uh, they are located, number one, either on the exchange site itself, for instance, the site of Kampung Sungai Mas over here. Number two, a few kilometers upstream from the exchange sites. So for instance, you see there are lots of temples over here, so the exchange site is over here. Number three, areas with high elevation and easily reached from the coastline. So for instance, the site which I was uh, working on, Bukit Churas, it is on top of a hill, and then very high elevation, but can, you can reach the temple directly from the sea. Okay, it is an easily reached area. And it is made of materials available in the immediate surrounding. Okay, so if in that area they have lots of laterites, then the temple is made of laterite. If the, temp is, if the area they have lots of mud, then we have uh, mud bricks. If the temple they have around the area they have lots of granite, then the temple is naturally made of granite. So they use whatever material available around them. So this uh, thing has been studied by Dr. Meljev. Huh? So he's one of the students in PBHG. And uh, they have very simple architecture. It appears that these temples can be made in three months' time. Very small, most of them. Huh? So they are quite small and can be made in three months to five months' time. And the mouldings are very limited and mostly made of granite and sandstone. Crudely made. Okay? Now, enough about temples. Let's go and have a look at other things. The images. So there are three, or there are four types of images in Bujang Wili. Number one is the Hindu images. Number two, we have the Buddhist images. Number three, we have decorative images. And number four, the images that we don't know what it is. Okay. So, so far for the Hindu images, we found three lingas. The first linga appears to have been nicely made, but it is broken. 
you know the the, the kepala the i mean the head is broken okay number two, this linga is like awkwardly made you know it is like sharp at top <laughs> so and number three, also we have a crudely made linga it appears to be made in a hurry okay and then with the linga they must be a yoni okay right? and let's us have a look at the yoni so we found five yoni so far two of the yoni are meant for achala linga achala linga means linga which are not supposed to be moved it is like a permanent linga you have the linga you put it there you don't move it okay it is for permanent worship so we know it is achala linga based on the presence of a hole over here so we simply take the linga and cucuk dalam saja okay we simply like fit it in and we have only two achala linga and we have three chala linga it means that linga which are for temporary worship so the linga are possibly made of rice uh, clay butter so they worship and after they worship the linga they simply dispose the linga so they are most of the lingas are disposable linga okay so these people appear to be in a hurry yeah? okay and then let us have a look at the icons so we have three ganesha one durga mahishasura mardini one nandi and one kurma Okay, let's have a look at the first Ganesha. This Ganesha is found in the site of Pengkalan Bujang, which I mentioned just now. Uh, it is made of clay or terracotta, roughly made, and it is broken. The second one, we are not sure where it came from. Some people say they found it in a river, but I'm not sure whether it is coming from the Kedah Tua period, the ancient Kedah period, or it was simply being brought in the later period. We are not sure. And the third one was discovered in site number 15. The one which my student... Uh, nicely reconstructed okay <laughs> okay so uh, this one uh, it is also crudely made and uh, it is no longer with us maybe uh, taken away by college whales and then we have this Durga Mahisha Tursura Mardini it is very crudely made also and uh, we have a broken uh, a broken Nandi okay it is one of the uh, Vahana for for the god Shiva and the Kurma uh, representation of God Vishnu. So we can be able to trace four Hindu cults. Number one is the Hindu worship, the Ganesha worship, the Duga worship, Shiva, as well as the Vishnu worship. Yeah? Okay? And these are some images that we found made of gold foil. This one is some unidentified goddess. We are not sure what it is. And we have a, uh, we call this a Nandi image made of a silver foil. Okay? Now we can have a look at the Buddhist image. Okay, so far the looking Buddhist image, we have only have four of them. This one is a broken Buddhist image, the only the head. Okay, it is about like 20 centimeters long. This one, it is uh, in the Raffles Museum uh, in Singapore. Very small, just around 10 to 15 centimeters. Portable, it looks very nice though. This one is a uh, Brikuti, one of the bodhi Bodhisattva. The size is like 3 centimeters. And this one is, uh, is also an Avalokiteshvara or a bodhisattva, we are not sure what kind of bodhisattva, but uh, found in Pengkala Bujang, missing, but also very small, very portable, you can put it in a pocket, okay? This is very small and easy to transport. Okay, let me show you the locally made uh, sculptures. I know that it is locally made because we did the scientific analysis already, so the materials were local. This one were not locally made, okay? And the locally made is pretty ugly, so, okay? Yeah, so it is, okay, um, it is, Aesthetically unappealing. <laughs> Aesthetically unappealing. It is not ugly. Okay. Uh, now first is we have this uh, seated Buddha. Okay. It is roughly made. Also a seated Buddha, standing Buddha, and Hariti. Well, just to be honest, it doesn't look very good. Okay. It appears to be made crudely and in a hurry and by using very cheap material. This material were available around the Pengkalan Bujang site. Okay. And then we have decorative images, of course. So this is a Dvarapala, a guardian of the door. So these two, we call it the dragon balustrade, found in Kampung Sungai Mas. Uh, they, these things are nicely made, of course. Okay, these things are nicely made. We have also a makara and few crudely made uh, makara and one elephant. That's all that we found. Okay? And then this is what we can conclude. First, all of the images are found associated with shrines, of course. And they can be dated from the 5th to 14th century CE. The 5th century is this one. We think that it is dated from at the 5th century CE, but it can be later. 
And then the Hindu images are mostly roughly made. Uh, the pedestal of the linga worship are meant for chala linga. It means that linga for temporary worship. And then the, almost all of the Buddha images are either portable, roughly made, or very small in size, or both. Okay? And the decorative image appear to show Indo-Javanese or Sumatran art. Okay, we, we, we did compare with the findings in, uh, in Sumatra, and one of them appeared to be brought from outside. Okay? So I was referring to this one. Okay, this is clearly of Sumatra art. And aside from uh, this material, we also found some stone pedestal. Lah. Okay, these are stone pedestal, and some images which we, uh, it is so broken, we couldn't be able to identify, identify uh, what they are, what, where they are from or what they are. But we can see it is this thing. This is kind of naked, so we are not sure if they wear something that we might be identified. Okay, and then we have some miscellaneous findings. You know, some reliquaries, gold rings, your earrings, and then we have some this artifact. This very nice artifact are taken away by the by you know by the gentleman who did the excavation in 1970. They took away all the nice artifacts. Huh? So what are the general characteristics of the findings? Number one. The Hindu Buddhist artifacts do not share any characteristic which made them stylistically similar. So they seem to be different. You know, they don't have any general characteristic which, which binds them together to be identified as the Kedah Hindu Buddhist art. We are not able to observe any regularity in terms of their style, execution or material which can bind them together as a single identity representing the ancient Kedah Hindu Buddhist art. You saw yourself the artifacts. So they seem to be brought in from different areas, made by different people who are not being trained in the same school of thought. Okay? And following are the observations that can be summarized from all these artifacts. Number one, shrines are mostly small in size, very simple architecture. Sculptures, either roughly made or small in size or both. And inscription, they are all short Buddhist mantras, name of Vritabhas, and they use foreign text. They use foreign writing system. Palava, post Palava, and Indo Javanese script. Okay? So, this is what we see, and this is what we know. Okay, based on these discoveries, what can we conclude about the nature of Hindu Buddhist art in ancient Kedah? With all that consideration, we need to first have a look at the settlement pattern of people of ancient Kedah. Okay, now we have already plotted the location and the fine spots of all those discoveries. First, the geography of ancient Kedah was extremely different before the 14th century CE. Those who have went to Kedah, we can uh, to the area of Merbo Muda area, you can see lots of this uh, lowland and paddy field. Correct. In those days, those lowlands did not exist. It did not exist. Those lowlands were in fact flooded by seawater. Okay? And then, the Jerai Peak was not in fact a, 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 a gunung, it is not a mountain, but it is a small peninsula extending towards the sea. And all the low lines were sea, in fact. And then, the, uh, most of the locals, and then as a result, Kedah was not a flat land, but it was a big bay. Okay, I'm going to show you the reconstruction later. And most of the local settlement, they consisted of coastal or floating villages while the trading posts are located on the uh, river estuaries. And based on our calculation, that area cannot be able to sustain more than 50,000 people at one time because the flatland is very limited and the people have to live literally on the sea. Huh? And except for the traders who are able to uh, get uh, their plot of lands near to the riverine area where we found most of the archaeological site. Okay, let us have a look at the reconstruction of the uh, ancient coastline. This was done for my master's thesis. Okay, okay this is the present coastline, uh, the red in color, and the, uh, the black one is the ancient coastline, and we reconstructed this way. Okay, so you see over here, so all the flatland used to be sea. And did I mention just now that the Arab record mentioned that ancient Kedah consisted of islands? And look, it is full of islands here. It is a large bay, and the archaeological site, the trading site, is located over here. You see? Or the estuary of river, and over here, and over here. And all the temple sites are located upstream from the 
ancient sites. So what can we conclude from this? And this, the settlements could have looked like this. It is uh, located on the coast. So it should be somewhere over here. See, on the coast, no, on the protected bay. So the population was smaller in those days. So these are supposing the, uh, the form of settlement. In terms of the demography, based on historical records, I'm, this is not sure, this is our hypothesis, uh, our working hypothesis. There are four elements of settlements in ancient Gada. First, the coastal settlers consisting of astro nations because you know, people, it is, a lang it is a language related to the Malay language. We are not sure what kind of language they speak, but they could have been astro nations because, okay, because until I find inscriptions that I'm not going to be convinced of any language. We need direct proof. So this is our hypothesis. Number two, <coughs> the inland semi-nomadic tribe consisting of astro asiatic speakers, the Orang Aslis. Until today, we still have them. Number three, for communities of foreign traders consisting of Arab, Indian, Chinese traders living in the ports and the upstream areas. I am referring to this area. So where we found lots of ceramics, Chinese ceramics, lots of Indian temples and lots of Arab glasses. It means that there were uh, communities of foreign traders over here. And finally, community of local artisans, iron workers and builders who live close to the traders. We have to be clear about this because the traders they cannot come here and live on their own they need support from the locals okay to sustain the population huh? so there are four elements of settlements in ancient Kedah. so this oops these are uh, the location of the settlement and i plotted all the archaeological sites on the ancient coastline and after the 14th century CCE, we can see how the coastline changed to the present day okay Now, what are the social conditions for Indianization? We go back to Indianization. Indianization is a slow process and how it influences society depends on the social conditions. And based on our observation on the societies in Indochina, in Sumatra, as well as in Java, there are three criteria that should be met by a society in order for them to be Indianized. Number one, they must have a large and settled population. Okay? Number two, they must have a well-structured social hierarchy so that the Indian conception of royalty can simply be accepted by them because they already have a similar social structure. And number three, they must have a strong and stable economy in order to have this social hierarchy. Yeah? So the community of native ancient Kedahans which were Indianized does not seem to fulfill these criteria. They consider of coastal settlers, and those who were Indianized are those who were living near to the uh, traders. And it doesn't seem to be large in number. Thus, for them to be able to produce their own form and identity of Hindu Buddhist art is most unlikely. So, what is our present working hypothesis right now? So, number one, ancient Kedahan who were influenced by Indian culture could have been those who live and work closely with the community of traders. Okay? I'm not talking about those people who live on the floating houses. I'm not talking about the people who live in the interior or the orang aslis. But I'm talking about the artisans, the iron workers, or anyone who, are, who lived with the Indian traders and could be easily influenced by their lifestyle. So they consisted of local middlemen, merchants, artisans, etc. And they only constitute a very small percentage of the overall population of ancient Gada. Number three, their settlement possibly located adjacent to the community of traders where the rest of the natives live further away. Okay? And uh, most of the native Kedahan live in the long shores in form of floating villages, etc. And the place where Indian culture influence could be felt could have been limited to certain pockets of settlements and port. Okay? So that is our working hypothesis right now based on the current discovery. We don't know what might be discovered tomorrow. But based on the present archaeological findings that we have, that is our working hypothesis. And how can we conclude this thing? So, ancient Kedah was not a centralized state. We know about that. It consisted of confederation of loosely connected settlements. 
Okay. Uh, and then uh, eight settlement works uh, roughly scattered along the northwestern coast of the Malay Peninsula, and those who had contact with the foreign traders are uh, usually situated in the Bujang Valley due to the favorable geographical condition. Number two, the, set the settlements which had contact with foreign traders took place in the area of Bujang Valley where several pockets or communities of traders were located, just like I showed just now. And... Uh, these traders' communities, they observe various cults of the Hindu Buddhist religion and could have influenced the native working or living around them. And these Hindu Buddhist communities does not, con does not comprise of just the Indians, but could have been the Indo Javanese and the Sumatrans as well, based on the Sumatran inscription that we found, or the Javanese inscription that we found just now, that I showed. Right? So they could have uh, consisted also of the people from Majapahit, people from the Mataram Kingdom, or maybe people from the Angkorian Kingdom, we don't know. But when I say Hindu and Buddhist, it does not necessarily refer only to the Indians. And uh, however, the number of local Kedahans who were Indianized could have been limited, to, uh, and their worship could have revolved around the shrines which were commissioned, not by them, but by the traders. And under these circumstances, and further supported by the forms of the Hindu Buddhist artifacts, the existence for a special identity of Hindu Buddhist art for ancient Kedah is unlikely. That is the conclusion that we can make based on this discovery. Okay? However, this is based on what we already have. We know that uh, the, uh, Bujang Valley is a big area, and then maybe in future research, uh, future excavation, we may find something which may prove that I'm wrong. But Currently, this is the theory that uh, we can be able to hold on to based on present discoveries. So, uh, the present research that we are doing now is that we are doing further excavations in the Sungai Batu Archaeological Complex. And also, we are having another site in Bukit Choras. Uh, it is located over here. Uh, in this complex, we found a big stupa surrounded by small shrines and a water tank on top of a hill made of laterite. So we are trying to uncover uh, the form of architecture and where they came from, and we hope that this research may be able to shed more light regarding the art and architecture of the people living in ancient Kedah. And if there is any new discovery, then I'm sure that it is going to be reported in the media. And all of you are invited to come to USM, you know, whenever you come to Penang and have a look at our galleries. And the archaeological site is open. Our site is open to the public, and all of you are free to enter. Yeah. So I think that's going to be all, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Nasha. Um, we now have time for a few questions. If there's, yeah. Uh, thanks, Dr. Nasha. Um, I have a few questions. Um, fascinating talk that you've um, shared with us. Um, you, in your, um, the image that you shared with us of all the remaining existing, some stolen, some missing artifacts, you made aesthetic judgments about the way they look. Yep. Some a little bit more crude, some much more refined, uh, some are nice to look at, some are less nice to look at. I was just wondering, of the kinds of the, uh, artifacts that are either crude or finely made, um, can you tell us, especially those who are carved in situ um, in ancient Kedah, is it perhaps a reflection of the skills that were cultivated. Um, if there are more crude um, artifacts, is that also a reflection that people were less skilled? Um, or something, you know, anything? Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, it is, when it comes to the uh, quote unquote quality of the artifact, there's only two issues, money and time. Okay, so it appears that these people don't have much time and then they don't want to waste much money. So, and this is not surprising for a port where it is where the settle, where the settlers stay there only for temporary time. You see, Kedah was a relay point for traders where they had to stay there for six, three to six months while waiting for the monsoonal change before they can be able to continue with their journey. So they have six months to stay in ancient Kedah, and in these six months, usually they are going to commission a temple to be built, you know, so that they can worship and to pray for a safe journey, etc., etc. So it is maybe due to the limitation of time and money 
that this artifact appears to be crude. So I think that is uh, the best guess that we can give. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the beautiful talk. Um, I'm just curious about the language that was spoken during this period. The, uh, uh, the language, language okay. that was spoken during this period. There must have been a spoken language. Uh, and uh, are there any references made um, in Indian manuscripts or any other manuscripts as to the language that was spoken? We don't know. All right. Uh, the best thing that we can come up with is a guess. Then, the, like I mentioned earlier, that there were four group of communities there. So the local communities could have spoken their own native languages and the traders could have used their languages also. You know, and the Sri people coming from Srivijaya could have used their languages also. But regarding what language was spoken among them, then we are not sure. Until we find some definitive discoveries such as inscription, etc., then there is no way for us to be sure about it. Hi, thank you for the talk. My question is, considering that there was an Arab settlement in ancient Kedah, is there no archaeological data that indicates a Muslim presence? Okay. Uh, now, going back to the site of Pengkalan Bujang. Okay, okay, this is an Arab uh, inscription anyway, Ibn Sridan. Okay, I want you to have a look at this site. I didn't dare to say this, but seeing that you ask. Over here, it is on the shine side. Uh, hold on, uh. Okay, this one. Okay, look at this one. We found a mihrab over here. And there is a mihrab here, and uh, next to it, there is an entrance, and we found a big jar where people wash, do the ablution. So, what do you think? And this is facing directly towards the west. I'm not making any assumption, but that is what we found. Some people imply that this structure resembles an early mosque. Resembles, I'm not saying that it is a mosque, but some people say that it resembles an early mosque, but this thing still needs to be studied. But even then, if this is not a mosque, then I don't think that the Arab would need to build a permanent structure for them to pray. You see, they can just pray anywhere. It is not necessary for Muslims to have a permanent structure. And as far as their dwellings, it could have been made of perishable materials. Because as far as the Indians are concerned, the only uh, permanent materials that they use is to build the temples. But as far as their dwellings, we can't find anything. So it could have been made of perishable materials. And they use uh, these permanent materials to build their temples because it is inside the Silpa Shastras. They have to use the best material available. And that's why most of the temples are, can be discovered. Okay. Yep. Are there any more questions? Was there any suggestion that Bodhidharma arrived in Kedah? Was there any suggestion that Bodhidharma, Bodhidharma? arrived in Kedah before he traveled to China? Uh, we don't have any historical reference rate. We, don't, we have not found any historical reference rate yet. Um, thanks, Nasha, for your beautiful sharing. Um, my question is very simple. Uh, you're talking about the, the recent uh, research and excavation on the Sungai, uh, Sungai Batu sites. So is there any new discovery, anything significant that you think that will reshape the new direction of your, the ancient history of uh, Kedah? The thing about the Sungai Batu complex is that it is the longest uh, uh, how am I going to put it? It is the site with the longest time span. Okay, for instance, Pengkalang Bujang site. Uh, I need to show you the map. Hold on. Mm. Okay, so this, there are many complexes in uh, Bujang Valley. Uh, the com in each complex, the sites are clustered together. The first complex is over here, Pengkalang Bujang. You can see the cluster. We have the Kampung Sungai Mas complex and Sungai Batu complex over here. 
The Pangkalan Buddha complex existed from the 7th century CE until the 14th century. The Sungai Mas complex existed from the 4th century CE to 14th century. But the Sungai Batu complex existed from 500 BC to 15th century. So it is a site with the longest time span, time span for development. And then we didn't know prior to the discovery of Sungai Batu how Kedah emerged. We didn't know why people simply choose Kedah. You know, because there were lots of other better pots in the north of the Malay Peninsula. So the discovery of iron smelting site gave us some insight regarding the uh, pooling factor which uh, drove the traders to come here in the first place. So it could have been iron products which made the traders come here. And as the trade started to develop in the 7th century, that area could not be able to sustain much traders at and they started to open other complexes in the 7th century in the Kampung Sungai Mas and in Pengkalan Bujang. So it appears that Sungai Batu was the nucleus of development for ancient Kedah of which after the, 14th, after the 4th century CE when the development becomes so big they don't have enough space that it spread to other areas. So we believe that Sungai Batu was the nucleus for the development of ancient Kedah and before it spread to other areas. And then uh, in Sungai Batu also we have the uh, the remains of jetties, but in other sites, they don't have remains of jetties. Uh, so it shows that the trade in Sungai Batu has already reached its peak. It has already been saturated before it moved to the other areas. Okay. I think we had a question over here. On language uh, spoken that was asked, uh, you, you mentioned about the Austronesian language. Yeah. Uh, Austronesian language is also classified as a Malay Polynesian yeah, yeah, language, it, is a larger, yeah, yeah. large so family. Yeah. So, this uh, in this area of South Asia, stretching from Madagascar to Easter Islands and uh, from southern Burma to uh, the Philippines, uh, these are Austronesian languages. And the base of Austronesian language is the Malay language. Yeah. So, there could be a variation of Malay language spoken could be. Uh, by the uh, local population. Not like what we're speaking now yeah, in Bahasa yeah. Melayu, but there are variations of it. Yes, yes, it could be, but we are simply not sure about what kind of morphology, syntaxis, or the phonology of the language until we have the epigraphic discovery, at least until we have an inscription like what we found in Java and Sumatra. So we are not sure about the form of language used, but yeah, it could have been a form of Malay language. Could have been. <laughs> right, is this on? Ah. Okay, what I found interesting about your talk was that you described an interesting setup where there is a decentralized city-state, if we can even call it a city-state, a loose confederation, where service over a period of seven centuries, possibly in fact more than seven centuries, the people seem to have been satisfied with temples and shrine structures and statues that were crude, simple, and temporary in nature. This strikes me as, um, as somebody who studied a fair amount of religious history as fairly unusual behavior. Because normally when people get prosperous in a trading port, or in fact under any circumstance, they come to believe that they should elaborate their temples and decorate them further. Whether it be just because people like bling, or just because Mm, they honestly believe that it will contribute to their prosperity. However, these elaborations don't seem to have happened over seven centuries. And, of course, it's possible that somebody was building fancy gold statues or fancy silver statues and those would not survive time because, well, there's certainly an incentive to take them apart. Yeah. But, mm, the absolute evidence of architectural elaborations out of non-precious materials, like say stone, wood, and so on, that's interesting and peculiar. Given all this over, some, how to put it, given that in seven centuries they didn't seem to have elaborated their work much, what do you think is the cause? Is the cause economic? Yeah, I think the cause is economy and time. Hmm. Because Solid. as I, I put it earlier, mm -hmm. when we want to say whether a temple was being built by local or not, okay, there are four considerations that we need to make. Number one is who commissioned the temple, where the building materials came from, where the uh, manpower came, uh, came from, and what kind of architecture that they are, they are using. 
because there are four considerations. And based on these four considerations, it appears that the temple was commissioned by traders within a limited time span by using unskilled local workers, by using local materials, and by using the uh, ground plan of an Indian temple. Okay? So uh, the crude form of this temple probably was due to the lack of funding and also due to the limited time frame that they have to build this commission temple, which is around six months. And one more thing we have to be clear, that the Indians were not the only people around in those days. It was not just the Buddhists who stayed there. As uh, mentioned uh, many times inside the Arab records, in Bujang Valley, there were also Chinese, Arab and Persian traders living alongside with the Indian communities. So the Chinese, Persian and Arab could have had their buildings too. But most of their building could have been made of perishable materials. While for the Indian traders, they have to use this best material because it is already stated in the Manashara Silpa Sastra that you have to use whatever building materials available around them. So their crude form of architecture is probably due to time itself mm, so because most of them are not uh, permanent settlers there, but they have to move elsewhere. You know, they were on the way to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. That is why, okay, yes. in our opinion. Of okay. course, this is not the best, uh, I mean, this is not a very complete hypothesis, but that is the best guess that we can come up with for now. My second question yes. is about the Arab texts that you mentioned. Yes. The ones that refer to Qadar as an island, is the word used in the Arabic jazira or some other word for island? I am not sure because I simply use uh, translated text uh, in English by G.R.T. Betts' book. So I am not proficient in Arabic. Oh, that's okay. unfortunate. Yeah. The Arabs have a very strange use of the word island. Yeah. Um, I think due to time constraints, we have time for one last question, but Dr. Nasha will be around after the talk if you have anything else you'd like to talk to him about. Oh, my last question is simple. Do you um, have a soft copy of your slides? Pardon? Do you have a soft copy of your slides? Yeah, of course. Uh, I think they, yeah, I've given the soft copy to them. Feel free. Wonderful. Feel free to take it. Huh? It's, it's for everyone. Uh, to me, archaeology belongs to humanity and we should share our information with everyone, regardless of nationality. <laughs> Thank you.